Though today, Apollo is most often called the god of the sun, in ancient times his identity was more complex. He performed many deeds by night, shooting his arrows hidden in darkness upon the Greek troops assailing Troy. He summoned wind for sailors, plagues for those who'd incurred his wrath, good health and long life for those he favored, and arrows of death for those whose time had come. He is called upon for aid in battle, to guide the spears, javelins, and arrows of heroes, or to brush those of their enemies aside. He is a slayer of dragons and averter of evil. A twin to Artemis, he protects the harvest, is a patron of the arts, a shepherd, a lover of trees and nature, god of wolves and crows, and even takes the form of a dolphin, for which his most sacred shrine named Delphi, the very center of the world according to the ancient Greeks, where he would issue the prophetic wisdom gifted to him by his father Zeus, for which he became famous across the western world. What is the nature of this most famous but seldom understood god? Hi, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon, which makes videos like this possible. And a big thanks to all my supporters. In the Iliad and Odyssey, the oldest of the Greek sources on Apollo, there is little indication he was thought to be the exact equivalent to the sun god Helios. Yet he has always been called Phoebus, meaning bright, shining, radiant, from which was derived the word Phoebazo, meaning to prophesy. Apollo was conceived by Zeus and born of Leto, but Queen Hera, discovering this infidelity, was furious. She watched out from the heavens and forbid her to give birth to a child in any place fixed in the earth or any place where the sun shone. Yet there was one place which was not fixed to the earth, nor was it in the sea or sky, and that was the island of Delos, which floated atop the waves. Some tales speak of Leto going there in the form of a wolf, or in the company of wolves, and we shall deal more with the wolf connection later. Others say that the north wind brought her there. Yet Delos is somewhat reluctant, saying she has heard that Apollo will be haughty, and therefore I greatly fear in heart and spirit that as soon as he sees the light of the sun, he will scorn this island. Notice the connection here between Apollo and the sun and its light. Yet Leto makes an oath to construct a temple there to the mighty god to be born, giving great benefit to the place. And so the island agreed to his birth there. In other versions, Poseidon has the island submerged beneath the sea in order that it might not be within the light of the sun raising it up again later, and this connection between Apollo and Poseidon is consistent through many myths. All the goddesses came to be in attendance for the birth, save Hera, and furious she tried to restrain Elithia, the goddess of childbirth, to prevent Leto from going into labor, but she was tricked into releasing her by the offer of a necklace of amber nine yards long. The symbolism of nine is reoccurring in the birth of Apollo, for Leto struggles to give birth for nine days and nine nights according to some sources. And that the necklace is made of amber also links it to Apollo and later stories that say Apollo's tears for Asclepius turned into amber and created the river Eridanos, which surrounds Hyperborea, the location of all amber. Other myths ascribe this creation of amber to Helios. He is born beneath the date palm tree, and the name for this tree is Dactulos in Greek, which refers to the finger, but more specifically in this case to a type of measurement. For instance, the dactylic hexameter is the name of the classical Greek poetic rhythm found in the Iliad and other ancient Greek-inspired poetry. This is the reason why he is born beneath this tree, because the name Dactulos is related to 
the word for measurement, and by extension poetry, harmony, and distance. And he is also born beside a stream called Inopos, perhaps meaning strong voice. Born amidst the rocks and crashing of sea, representing the sound of wind and waves. As soon as he was born, the island became fixed to the earth and no longer wandered. And some versions even say that everything around turned to gold and that swans swam around it. According to Hesiod, when he was born, he had a golden sword in his hand, something that is also possessed by Hermes and gods associated with light and sun in the Rigveda. And on the first taste of ambrosia, fed to him by Thames, goddess of divine law, he became a strong, fine youth of most beautiful aspect. As soon as he was fed the nectar, his power surged forth. No bond could hold him, and he declared that he would be master of archery, of the lyre, and would interpret the will of Zeus, and proclaim it to man. That Thames is the first to feed him demonstrates his close bond to divine order, as does his three proclaimed powers upon birth. Archery is related to distance, crossing distance and focusing on a target to strike from afar. The lyre represents music, cosmic harmony, and expression of the divine law. And the will of Zeus is the mind of the supreme consciousness of heaven, knowledge of which is gained through illuminating the mind. Soon afterwards, Apollo was gifted his great silver bow by Hephaestus, the craftsman of the gods. Hephaestus likewise is said to craft the thunderbolts of Zeus, as well as various armors for heroes. The shafts of Apollo were likely thought to relate in some way to fire and light, and the Homeric hymn also makes such a connection calling the brilliant light from a fire lit by Apollo as his shafts. All the gods are said to shake in fear before this bow. When Apollo comes into the presence of the gods, Leto is the only one to remain without fear at the side of Zeus. She then approaches and disarms her son, and only once disarmed with his lyre in hand may the gods relax in his presence. The arrows of this bow were often deadly, sometimes causing instant destruction, other times plagues. Rarely Apollo was said to fire his shafts as lightning bolts, but generally they seemed to affect the body of a person. It was said that if someone fell dead suddenly, that they were struck by the far shooter. By Zeus, Apollo was granted a golden chariot pulled by swans that carried him through the sky. This connection to swans is persistent and may be connected to artifacts from the site of Delphi, predating the writing of Homer by several hundred years. Based on archaeological finds, the site was strongly influenced by the Hallstatt culture, possibly even as part of the Amber trade network, reflected in the myths of Apollo and Helios. One of the most common motifs of the Hallstatt culture was a double or triple waterfowl symbol. It is possible that a number of the ideas and motifs surrounding Apollo are influenced by a god of the Hallstatt culture which is demonstrated to have had an impact archaeologically on the earliest stages of the site of Delphi, Apollo's most important center. It's also possible that these are the same people identified in Greek myth as the Hyperboreans with whom Apollo was closely tied in myth. Some say that Apollo grew up raised by the Threi, the bee nymphs who know divination, and that he learned the art of building and honed his prophetic skills as well as herded cattle. His connection with the protection of flocks and herds is perhaps part of the reason he is connected with the wolf, as a protector of the flocks from the wolf. But one of the first great acts of Apollo was the slaying of the dragon called Python, variously said to have been the consort of Typhon, the beast that his father Zeus had to confront and defeat in a hard-fought battle. In some myths, it was sent by Hera to pursue Leto as she struggled to find somewhere to give birth. Apollo sought vengeance against it, a common theme associated with the god. 
In other tales, it was simply a nasty beast guarding the place of Delphi where the god was wont to set up his temple. Slaying it with a hundred missiles, he gloated, saying, Here shall the earth and shining Hyperion make you rot. He comes then upon a spring that has been hidden, and he smashes apart the stones that covered it, liberating the waters and causing them to flow as a beautiful stream down to the sea. Then desiring men to build him a great temple there, he spots a ship upon the sea and comes to it in the shape of a dolphin. With a mysterious wind blowing, the ship carrying the men and the dolphin, they land near the site. The dolphin springs up like a star at midday and flashes of fire with a brightness that reached to the heaven. He then lit a fire at the site of his shrine, showing the splendor of his shafts, and the light of that fire filled the entire region, but the people were terrified, and then he appears again in the form of a man, and came to his hijacked sailors with a generous offer. Stay here and build a temple and receive great abundance on behalf of the god. And so the site was named Delphi, after the form of the dolphin that he took to acquire his first priests. To them he gave knowledge of the deathless gods, and of what was yet to be. Though the dragon is suggested to be a pestilence of some kind, it is curious that it is located at the site thought to be the center of the earth. In this way it may relate to a very ancient myth of a dragon which is located at the root of the cosmic tree that grows up from the center. Various scholars suggest that the myth of Apollo replacing Gaia at the site represents a later Greek supplanting of an earlier pre-Greek earth goddess worship. This is likely not the case. Across Indo-European myth, gods associated with sky and consciousness are seen to take command over aspects of the material cosmos. Often it has nothing to do with replacing previous gods, but is the consciousness or spirit ruling over things or places. To bolster the argument, early female figurines are sometimes provided as evidence, but these actually come from the site of a temple to Athena nearby and are almost certainly early votives to her or a goddess associated with her. So although often mentioned, the idea that Apollo supplanted an earlier earth goddess at the site is not supported by evidence. The legend is part of the cosmological understanding of the development of Apollo. The first to rule was the earth, who was in the first. Then it was Themis, goddess of natural law, and directly associated with Apollo. Then it was Phoebe, Apollo's grandmother, who then passed the site on to Apollo. It is really just another way of showing Apollo's connection to prophecy, divine law, and mental illumination, little different from his actual genealogy. Another popular fable to dispel is that the Pythian priestess sat above a vent in the earth that leaked gas, and this caused hallucinations. This idea is linked to sensationalized articles that ran after it was discovered that there was uh, such a vent near the site, but it was unlikely to have leaked gas into the temple during any time the temple was active, and even if it actually ever leaked, there's no evidence that it did. There is simply evidence that there is some sort of trapped gas under the earth in the area, but there is no evidence that this gas leaked out or that it was connected with the site in any way. So with that out of the way, right after the dragon is slain, Apollo liberates trapped water and creates a spring, fitting in with the general dragon slaying motif found in later European sources. But it also connects him with a constant theme of flowing. The places which Apollo is said to delight in are all mountain peaks and high headlands of lofty hills and rivers flowing out of the deep, and beaches sloping seaward, and havens of the sea are your delight. He is described as being born on Mount Kynthus in that rocky isle in Seeger Delos, while on either hand a dark wave rolled on landwards, driven by shrill winds. Whence arising, you rule over all mortal men. 
There is little doubt he was linked to the wind, as various myths about him show, but not as the wind, but rather one who acts through the wind, as related to spatial distance striking from afar, and the movement of light which travels or is born through the wind. The gods of wind are born of the god of the constellations and the dawn goddess, and are likely viewed as carrying the light of dawn across the world, but the wind itself originating in the high heavens. Thus Boreos was said to bear Leto to Delos, and several of his sons were said to be priests of Apollo in Hyperborea. Apollo likewise has a rivalry over the love of a flower with Zephyr, god of the west wind, connected with growing plants in springtime. Apollo wins, but then kills his love with a bad toss, misdirected by the wind in revenge, a major bane for any archer. After slaying Python, some stories tell of how Gaia was angry with the murder of her child. She threatened the cities of the earth with darkness and took the gift of prophecy away from Apollo, replacing it instead with dream visions obtained by men who slept on the ground. The young Apollo went to his father for help, and Zeus restored his powers with a shake of his hair and dispelled the truth obtained from the darkness. Although this myth in particular is thought to link to the replacement of an earlier earth goddess cult, it actually seems to attack one link to the cult of Zeus himself. In the Iliad, we are told that special priests of Zeus at Dodona slept upon the ground and walked barefoot in order to obtain prophecies, perhaps in dreams, from Zeus, who was connected with a sacred oak tree there. It remained an important oracular shrine, possibly into the 4th century AD, but this practice described sounds exactly what took place at Dodona and was linked to Zeus, not with Gaia. Although Python was a beast, he was still the son of a goddess, and Apollo was found to be guilty of murder. Gaia wanted to have him sent to Tartarus, but Zeus ordered him to purify himself of sin instead, exiling him from Olympus and having him serve as a slave of Admetos for again nine years. He lived under the direction of Admetos herding cattle, whom he grew very fond of, and later Apollo convinced the fates to spare his life in exchange for the life of his wife, allowing him to live longer. Once the oracular god's time was served, Zeus himself performed the purification ritual on him, in the waters of Peneus. Yet the trials of this young god were far from over, still full of hatred for Leto. Hera summoned the giant Titios to her aid. She sent him after the mother of the twins in order to ravage her. On her way to Delphi from Delos, she is seized upon by the giant who makes to carry her off. Woe to her, should her son not have been Apollo. The young god came racing to her rescue, firing his deadly arrows, and joined too with his sister Artemis. Zeus then hurled the giant into Tartarus, pegged him to the stone over an area of yet again nine acres. A pair of vultures feast on his liver daily but it regrows every night, so that the torment will endure forever. Apollo again takes to defending his mother and her honor when he learns of the hubris of Niobe. The mortal woman boasts that she was superior to Leto, for she had fourteen children, and Leto only had two. She dared to go on, claiming that Apollo was girlish and Artemis boyish. Apollo killed all of Niobe's sons, and Artemis all the daughters, save two, Chloris and Amoclas, who prayed to the gods to spare them. Their father, Amphion, is said to either commit suicide, or try and attack Apollo in a rage, getting himself shot down. Niobe turned to stone after she wept, and her tears became the river Achelous. The Niobes were left unburied for again, nine days. When Chloris later had the son Nestor, famous from the Iliad, Apollo grants him the years he had taken away from the Niobids, explaining why he was able to live for such a long time. The story shows Apollo punishes sin and hubris, 
but also how Apollo and Artemis are linked to lives and lifespans of men and women, which we will look at in depth a little later. When Heracles seeks to cleanse himself for the murder of his family, it is to Delphi he goes to ask Apollo what he must do. It is then that Apollo changes his name from Alcides to Heracles, and sets him on a path of the famous labors. After completing his mission, Heracles again commits murder, and contracts a disease presumably from the sin incurred. He travels to Delphi again to seek an oracle, but one is not forthcoming from the priestess. He then flies into a rage and tries to steal the tripod of Apollo, symbolizing his prophetic powers. And the two gods begin to fight over it, with Apollo supported by Artemis and Heracles supported by Athena. The combat is resolved by Zeus, who demands that Heracles return the tripod and also receive an oracle. And that oracle tells him that he is to be sold into slavery for a year. A win-win, it would appear. Apollo was well known for his fierce side, and this is perhaps nowhere better emphasized than with his music contest with Marseus. As the tale goes, Athena had invented the Aflos, a type of double-piped flute, but when she realized how it made her cheeks puff out when she played it, she tossed it aside and lay a curse upon it that whomever should pick it up would be punished. Marcius happened upon the flute, picked it up and began to master the instrument, until he was so fine a player that he challenged Apollo to a music contest. When Apollo won, he had Marcius strung up from a tree and flayed alive, his blood creating the river Marcius. Harsh as this is, it relates to a general theme around the god as one who punishes for transgressions or hubris, and it is exactly this aspect that links him to one of his most famous actions in the Iliad, the plague that he fires upon the troops of the Danaeans. The cause was the affront to the god committed by Agamemnon, by refusing a ransom for one of his priests and insulting him. Apollo struck back with vengeance, exacting punishment until atonement was made. This punishment and atonement is to be found in many of the tales of Apollo. He can absolve people from their wrongdoings, but he also punishes for it. Apollo is also a god with many tragic loves, and these lovers are sometimes personifications of plants, animals, or song. Primary among them are the Nine Muses, but also Akakadis, the Daffodil. Daphne, the laurel tree, Chrysothemis, the golden natural law, who is associated with agriculture, but also Coronis, the crow, Hyacinthos, the hyacinth, and many more. In general worship in certain areas, Apollo is strongly connected to agriculture and the harvest. One of his largest festivals, the Carnea, is connected with the harvest, and Apollo is generally a protector of the crops, fields, and flocks. It may be through this that he became Lycaeus, the wolf god, for as the guardian of the flocks, he is a warder of wolves, but against those who have wronged the god, he may well set the wolves upon their flocks. This aspect of the guardian of the fields may relate to one of his most interesting myths, the death of Asclepius and the slaying of the Cyclopes, which combines nearly all the major aspects we have seen thus far. Asclepius is said to be the son of Apollo and the crow, and was a very gifted mortal doctor, who became so skilled in his craft he was able to prolong life and even raise people from the dead. However, the skill of raising the dead transgressed the natural order and so Zeus killed him with a thunderbolt. Yet, as in all cases, when one connected with Apollo is wronged, it is not without repercussions. Though he would not seek retribution against his father Zeus, Apollo instead punished the forgers of his thunderbolt, the Cyclopes. He takes them down with his far shooting, then hides his arrow beneath a mountain in the north, perhaps suggestive of a volcano and again suggesting a fiery aspect to these arrows. 
Zeus learns of this and decides to make Asclepius a god of health and medicine, and represents him in the sky as a serpent holder. And in certain renditions of this myth, it links the return of Apollo's arrow with the reaping of a bountiful harvest. A possible agricultural reading of this myth might be the good health of the crops which are in a stage of ripening is threatened by stormy weather. Apollo dissipates the storm clouds and drives off the thunder giants with his fiery arrows, creating the ideal weather for the final stages of the grain harvest. Certainly it is not a coincidence that Apollo is the one to kill the primordial gods of storm, and this is connected with his role in agriculture. But Apollo is also the father of Aristeos, a rustic god of shepherds, beekeeping, medicinal herbs, and most interestingly, the Atessian winds. These are strong winds that blow out of the north and are called upon to alleviate the scorching heat, pestilence, and disease associated with the dog star Sirius. Aristeos was also said to have alleviated drought, connecting him with Zeus as rain god. Some accounts say that he was the son of Uranus, but most believe him to have been the son of Apollo, and likely the far shooter in more archaic times was thought to have greater powers over the general sky and weather than are preserved. To understand Apollo further, we need to look to the etymology of his name. Now, some believe it to mean the destroyer, and others see it as meaning one of the assembly, or as relating to a pre-Greek Anatolian name, Apidianos, a god name invoked in a Hittite treaty, and which may mean the entrapper, and others still look further east to Aplu, a plague god who is the son of a sun god. I am personally most convinced by the argument that his name comes from Epelai, uh, referring to a declaration, a boast, or promise, as this is directly connected to one of his main functions as the god of prophetic utterances, and fits in perfectly with the genealogy provided by Hesiod and others. So he is the son of Zeus, and thus a bright spirit of consciousness. His mother Leto, a name perhaps meaning obscure, hidden, or modest, is sister of Asteria, meaning fallen star, who fled from Zeus after the war with the Titans and became the island of Delos, the very island Apollo was born upon. She is a goddess of fallen stars and prophecies made by observing them. She is thus associated with the nighttime divination, and it would seem that most likely her sister Leto is perhaps the opposite of this then, associated with the daytime divination, and thus light. This dualistic night and day nature of the sisters is in some respects perhaps mirrored in Apollo and Artemis who become associated with sun and moon. But the nature of the grandparents on the mother's side are often just as much or more critical to the nature of the grandchildren in these genealogies. Apollo is the grandson of Phoebe, meaning the feminine version of Apollo's own common byname Phoebus. This means bright, shining, or radiant, as she was the titaness of illumination and prophecy and the central axis of the earth, Delphi, daughter of Gaia and Uranus. His grandfather was Koyos, meaning query or question, but he is also identified as Polos, meaning the central axis of the sky or pole star. As one of the four Titan brothers who held Uranus, he is the personification of one of the four pillars that hold the sky, the northern pillar. And Apollo is likewise strongly connected to the north and Hyperborea. Both grandparents and mother are connected to prophecy, and both are connected to the central axis points, with Phoebe a goddess of the prophetic mind and Coeus of question. It seems probable that they are titans representing the cosmic center from which flows all knowledge, but also around which moves the cosmos. The name Phoebe is used likely in relation not with 
the light of the sun, but with brightness and illumination as a mental state. That which is revealed, or the one who illuminates the mind. Apollo's place is at the center, either at Delphi or in Hyperborea, likely representing the northern pole. In Delphi, during the winter months, it was thought that Apollo journeyed to the north, and his presence left the temple. This is a strange thing for the sun god to do, as in the winter it actually travels south, but his disappearance does seem linked to the season. Perhaps he ventures to the north from the center of the earth to the center of heaven, where he rules over the music of the cosmos, represented by the movement of the heavens and stars, more noticeable during the winter with its longer nights. Apollo may also be linked to the heat and light of the sun, just as the Homeric hymn calls the light of the fire his shafts. With great insight, the Orphic hymn to Apollo references the sun as his eye, and states that all the differences in nature and their accord are the result of Apollo, and that the seasons change in accord to his music, with the seasons represented as notes on his lyre. Thus, the flow and harmony of the world are ascribed to Apollo as expressions of music. In Egypt, Apollo is linked not with Ra, the sun god, but with Horus, a sky god who had the sun and moon for his eyes, perhaps influencing the Orphic description. His name means the distant one, similar to Apollo being the far shooter. Yet though some have argued he was not associated with the sun initially, the Homeric hymn does seem to hint uh, at this connection, if it does not say so explicitly. Helios is mentioned several times in the hymn, and Apollo himself invokes Helios under his alternative name, Hyperion, meaning the High One, and his choice in this name may also be to invoke the sense of distance which he is connected with. It is clear he wasn't the physical manifestation of the sun, but there is definitely a connection being made. Helios distributes the light of the physical sun, and drives its course through the sky, but Apollo has much wider associations, most especially with that of mental illumination. Totality, distance, law, and harmony. The sun is only one part of the aspect of Apollo. However, it might be that Apollo was at an early stage connected to the movement of the sun, and this is partly why he is connected to distance. A key point about the sun is the daily movement across visible space. In Vedic sources, the god Vishnu was said to create that space with three strides, and this appears to have been the spatial distance measured out by the movement of the sun. The god Savitar, sometimes equated with the sun, sometimes distinct from it, seems to have been linked also to this movement and inspiration of the sun, with his name me meaning the impeller. He is strongly connected to the punishment and purification of sin, an element also key to Apollo. Perhaps also connected to this is his rule from the center. It is from the center that all things extend outwards, and which all moves around. Zeus was said to have measured out the world by flying two eagles from the edges. Where they met was Delphi, where the omphalos or navel was again connecting the site, and thus Apollo, with measuring distance. Music also is closely connected with measurement, as is the movement of sun and moon who traverse the world. The sun is said to measure out the world, and so it's possible that Apollo was connected with at least this particular solar aspect in the ancient period. Apollo's connection with wolves may also have a strange and unlikely connection with this celestial movement. People have long sought for an explanation as to why Apollo is consistently associated with the wolf. At Delphi, a bronze statue of a wolf stood before his altar. His mother was said to have been in the form of a wolf or accompanied by wolves when he was born. A myth tells how he directed wolves to suckle Miletos of Crete. In Argos, 
A myth speaks of Danaos witnessing a fight between a wolf and a bull. He came to associate himself with the wolf, and when it won, took it as an omen from Apollo, and later created the temple to Apollo Lycaos. When various followers were confused by this in later times and sought an explanation in the brightness of the eyes of the wolf or the wolf appearing at dawn, in Norse myth, the sun and moon are said to be chased by, or in some cases led by, wolves. These wolves effectively determine the movement of the sun and moon, impelling their flight through the heavens. Is this just a coincidence? A key power associated with Apollo is inspiration or impelling, according to the dictates of harmony and law. Music is a prime force of such inspiration and mental illumination. According to Pythagoras, who is thought by some to be the son of Apollo, everything in the world had a number, but that number was an expression of a note of music. The sun, moon, and stars were all thought to have their own sound, and the cosmos ultimately was formed of music. But music, if nothing else, is sound, and so, as a god of music, Apollo can't only be a god of light, for what is most important about Apollo is that he is the god who not only knows the supreme cosmic consciousness of his father Zeus, but also proclaims it to man. Now these proclamations are done through speech utterances, bringing us back to the, the possible meaning of his name, and also making sense of his genealogy. If he is the grandson of Fuibe, the illumined one, and question, and the son of obscured, then he is one who actually provides up those prophetic answers, but perhaps not in a straightforward way, obscured or masked or hidden, as the name of his mother suggests. Apollo is the one who connects man to this higher illuminated knowledge. One of his messages upon the temple at Delphi was, Know thyself. This perhaps has the meaning of know your proper place in the world, an idea that relates back to seeking harmony. And this harmony, governed over by Apollo, nonetheless seems to originate in the mind of Zeus and his intentions, which Apollo alone knows. He can connect man with the understanding of Zeus, the supreme consciousness, through purity, inspiration, the mental light of spiritual practice through art, music, and of course, oracles. Yet his connection with speech and sound and the illumination of the soul may link to another one of his aspects, health and death. In archaic Greece, it was forbidden to make statues of human beings. Only gods were permitted such representations. The first breaking of this was the creation of the Parthenon. Yet before this time, the wealthy would put up generic representations of the deceased, a young beardless man or a young woman. It is thought that these statues are actually representations of the gods Apollo and Artemis, who stand to represent the souls of the dead. Old people and even infants were found buried with these kore, and so it cannot be intended to represent the actual person. This is also why men and women struck down by sudden unknown causes were said to be hit by arrows of Apollo or Artemis, for they could sever the person's spirit from their body. It may be that Apollo and Artemis represent the individual soul of man and woman. In either case, they seem to be able to decide upon the time of a person's death and even able to negotiate with the fates to extend a person's life beyond their natural years. Or it may be that their influence over the soul of man is able to perpetuate him in life by their grace. The health of the body was thought to rely on a delicate balance of various elements within, and this harmony is something connected to Apollo. Yet one's health was also affected by things like sin, demonstrated in various myths, including around Heracles. Apollo places that punishment in the form of his arrow, 
and yet he can also absolve one from sin through purification. Apollo's birds, the raven and the swan, likewise have peculiar connections. The raven is a bird of prophecy connected to death and the souls of the dead. In the northern tradition is connected with Odin, where it is, like with Apollo, said to observe things on behalf of the god. The raven is also the smartest of birds, more intelligent even than most apes. They were seen as having the wisdom of the spirit world, for they were in close connection with death, and it is from that other realm where great knowledge is obtained. But the raven was likewise connected with wind and air. Consider the Mithraic cult that spread across Europe in the Roman period. Mithras is almost always featured with the raven behind him, above his fluttering cloak in the air, and it's likely that the raven here represents wind or air, with the raven potentially acting as the intermediary or messenger between Sol and Mithras based on his placement. Apollo turns the raven's feathers black according to some versions of the myth, and this would seem to relate to the bird being burnt, potentially. The swan is another of Apollo's birds. A chariot pulled by swans was gifted to him by his father Zeus. The symbology is connected to another set of twins, Castor and Pollux, who are born from a swan egg after Zeus seduces their mother in the form of a swan. In origin, the Dioscuri were likely associated with leading the sun. Cygnus, the swan in another myth, was a good friend of Phaethon, a mortal son of Helios. When Zeus killed him for nearly burning the earth to ash, Cygnus was heartbroken and made a sad song for his friend. When Zeus heard it, he turned him into the constellation. So when Apollo has swans to pull his chariot, there is an obvious solar connection being made here, because many of the myths involving swans are connected directly with light or the sun. The origin of this appears to be Hyperborean, that is to say, from the Hallstatt culture and their symbolisms of the water birds in connection with the solar disk. Yet there is another strange connection between the swan and music. Now, the swan is not particularly a good singer, it's something that's pointed out in these tales by drawing attention to their voice. Normally, the swan is fairly silent, and when they do make a sound, it's not far different from that of a duck. But there is a connection between the swan singing and death. The swan is supposed to sing beautifully after it's dead, and this seems hinted at in the tale of Zeus and the swan just mentioned. There's likewise a connection between the Dioscuri and death, and the death of the son of Helios. In a Homeric hymn, it says, Phoebus, Of you even the swan sings with clear voice to the beating of his wings. The key word here is even the swan. The idea of the sound and singing may likewise be partly the reason for the association with Apollo. But the sun itself, in most archaic sources, was connected with death. The souls of the dead were connected with the sun, and it was solar-related gods in the Vedic sources who escorted souls in death. Solar symbols appear also on Romano-British graves. This is in part because, as the source of energy in the visible world, the sun is the gateway for the spirit, but also because the sun sets at night in the west, figuratively dying there. So from Ireland to Greece, the west was the location of the blessed dead, who reside in bliss in a sunny land. Pindar says that the righteous go to that land after the third life, and that they get there following the road of Zeus to the tower of Kronos. This seems to mean the pathway of the sun to the place where time resides, or rather, ends, as the sun is likewise the one who measures out time, said by some to be the father of the hours, otherwise an honor belonging to Kronos. 
There is much more that could be said of Apollo, who is one of the most complex of all Greek gods due to his many varied associations. Yet his core associations are with prophecy, inspiration, the soul, distance, illumination, purification, music, and harmony. Most of his tales can be explained through his connection with these concepts, all of which are interconnected. In a cosmological sense, Apollo is higher than the sun because he is a master cosmic organizer. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, stand tall.